All right. Hey, hey, y'all. This time we're going to finish up uh, Sarah Ahmed's The Cultural Politics of Emotion. So a few things to say. You can find me at Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy if you want to look at pictures of my cats mostly. Uh, you can find this in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get your podcasts. Um, you can contribute to me if you'd like uh, through PayPal or Patreon, but you know, any amount that you'd like to give me in these times, consider instead giving to people who need it a lot more, like Black Lives Matter, to any organization that is helping uh, yeah, trans women or indigenous folk, the tr trans people, I should say, indigenous folk, any anyone that is in need of help now, consider giving any money you thought about giving here to, to there and defer any amount you'd want to give to me indefinitely. You know, these people need help more. Um, but I would like to thank those people that have helped me keep this going because it's it's a lot of work. Uh, there's Amrit, Anshul, Boz, Hanrik, James, John, Eust, Julio, Killswitch, Matt, um, and Paul, who've all been really helpful in keeping this going, and I appreciate it a lot. So this episode is going to start from Chapter 3, titled The Effective Politics of Fear. So she starts this chapter by considering Franz Fanon. So uh, Franz Fanon was a, um, a psychologist, psychiatrist from Martinique, uh, and he wrote extensively on race. Some of his biggest books were The Wretched of the Earth and uh, Black Skin, White Mask, uh, in which he, you know, he describes the experience of black, mostly black men um, in, in Africa in relation to colonial people and in France, of course, all over the world, the experience of black people uh, in relation to white, white people. And she begins with a quote from him in which he describes a white child seeing him, where the white child is pointing and calling out the fact that he's a black man. Uh, and Fanon describes how in that moment, he became very aware of his skin. Uh, he, he became very aware of his, his body. And suddenly he became hyper aware of of the space in which that his his body was taking up being is taking up and this this boy was feeling like clearly demonstrating fear of the black man or, or as a kind of had a kind of disgust of the black man and this fear worked to galvanize and to con to construct the boy's subject position in relation to Fanon's object position where Fanon is an object of this gaze this boy's gaze that Marks Fano, where the boy doesn't, you know, the boy sees other white people and doesn't see color, right? The, the boy only sees uh, the, what they've totally normalized. And it is in seeing the black skin that the boy marks that. And in marking that, Fano becomes hyper aware of his identity. So fear in this setting, Ahmed uh, kind of defines as the interpretation of an immediate threat of an immediate coming threat or a coming object that threatens your space and she uh makes a distinction between fear as that and anxiety where she says anxiety is less the fear of something coming to me as it is of me going to something that i am not comfortable with so like hate presented in the last chapter of the last episode she says that fear it floats it, 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 it circulates because then it's used to, to target specific people and it's used to galvanize certain group identities uh, in certain racial uh, categories and, and gendered and, and sexual ones. And the circulation of fear justifies not only or it, or it constructs not only the other, you know, and marks them on the basis of their skin or gender or class or anything like that. It also works to... Um, justify the formation of certain safe-like zones, like securing the borders, like gated communities, like ideas of home and family and community that are often mobilized in ways to foreclose entry by those people that we consider to be fearful, that 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 we consider fearful, that we that we fear, 
So which bodies are afraid of which bodies? This is what Ahmed's trying to get at here. Where if fear were objective for Ahmed, the people who are, or rather people who have the most risk in their lives, you know, marginalized people, people who don't have wealth, people don't have social status, something like that, it would seem as though if fear were objective, those people would have the most fear because they have they don't have defenses. Whereas, in fact, the data seems to suggest that those furthest from risk, that is rich people, people with, you know, uh, a lot of um, a lot of so social safety nets, a lot of ways to, to maintain their prosperity, tend to be the most afraid, which is interesting. Because if, if fear were really objective, if it was objective to be afraid of certain people, it would be experienced by those people that are the most vulnerable, when in fact that doesn't seem to be the case. So we can then disentangle or consider kind of legitimate from illegitimate fear when we consider for whom fear forecloses rather than fosters safety. So if for someone fear allows them, you know, motivates them to retreat into a kind of gated community where they could have like firearms to defend themselves against uh, invading others, then we have to be a little bit skeptical of the fear that they're describing like the fear that is constantly being touted by conspiracy theorists about like right now uh how the potential covid vaccine is actually a way to control the population of course it, it happens to be people not not always because uh vaccine hesitancy is not something that is only experienced by privileged people absolutely not but when those people that are, you know, have a lot of power are say something that like uh, the COVID vaccine is going to be a way for like Bill Gates to um, spy on them, we have to ask, what do these people think their cell phones are if they think that, you know, a vaccine is what is going to track them? Why is it that these people feel in many cases, you know, well off white people feel that they are under threat when in fact they they aren't. So if we return to the beginning with that description by Fanon of the white child who uh, kind of winces in fear from the black man and and goes into his mother's arms to, to feel safety, she says that the, the fear of that child has to be interrogated for that fear is not a fear of losing everything you have. That fear just strengthens your position and in many ways, you know, that child is probably seen as a victim. Like the black man infringed upon the the child's uh, kind of safe setting. And so we have to then coddle that child even more. So bodies that are, are allowed to move or are open to move in responses to fear should really question that experience they're having of fear. Because we have to interrogate how potent that fear really is if it opens up possibilities rather than foreclose them because if the black man experiences fear he has to suck it up and deal with it because if he gets angry or tries to demonstrate any kind of emotional response like uh being pulled over by the police then there's the risk that he might just die that's just what might happen but she does something here that I think is super interesting. And this is one of the things I really like about Ahmed is it, she leaves like no stone unturned. So we're, we were considering here the way that fear for some people allow more mobility. So she's like, okay, if we accept that, then what sense can we make of the discourses that followed 9-11? Where after that, it was seen as though the United States was, was frozen it wasn't allowed to expand or move, that it was just kind of halted in its tracks. So wouldn't that then mean that their fear is justified because that fear that they experienced kind of stifled any possible movement? And we can add to that the fact that the United States was floating this narrative that these terrorists were these hypermobile kind of deterritorialized others that could be anywhere at any time that don't you know, abide by borders or any kind of restrictions, they can just be anywhere. So it would seem then that this this whole idea that fear, for, for those whom fear allows more mobility, doesn't, would then mean, sorry, 
that the United States was justified to be scared. Their fear was justified following 9-11. So she says, no, 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 no. We have to think about this a little closer. Because what we saw following 9-11 was an entire mobilization of military efforts against, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan. Uh, what we saw were these massive mobile movements to these parts of the world that had nothing to do with 9-11, uh, had nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction, had nothing to do with anything like that, it had everything to do with oil, AO, uh, that really troubled the idea that America was really frozen. And then we have other things like Bush saying, go out, act like everything's normal, spend your money, buy, shop, consume, showing us that these people didn't weren't actually frozen in their tracks they were actually encouraged to move and any kind of immobility that was uh, demonstrated or 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 was believed to have occurred is purely cosmetic and it wasn't didn't reflect the kind of essence of america at the time and then we saw the kind of freezing of of others where anyone who is possibly um you know, accused of having any affiliation with terrorism in any way would be like immediately incarcerated. Where neighbors were ca called uh, on by, you know, the police were called for, to arrest people's neighbors because they were celebrating on 9-11 or something like that. Or they were, um, you know, acting suspicious in some way, not to mention racialized people, just people from uh, of kind of Muslim heritage who happened to be uh, passing as such would, you know, just experience discrimination on a whole new level. So their identity was kind of frozen and galvanized in that way. So she concludes this chapter by saying that the present hence becomes preserved by defending the community against the imagined other who may take, uh, who may take form in ways that cannot be anticipated. And this I don't want to go too much into this because this is my own research, but there's something very interesting that occurs here when you imagine an other uh, as being a potential threat, because that opens up an interesting creative uh, responses to that other, which often take very violent uh, means, take very violent forms. But anyways, that puts us here into chapter four, the performativity of disgust. So she begins this chapter by considering a Darwin quote in which he describes the disgust an indigenous person uh, uh, evoked or demonstrated to his food, the food he was eating. The indigenous person found it disgusting. So Ahmed asks, why do we come to feel disgust? Well, firstly, we must make clear that disgust implies proximity. You have to be close to something to be disgusted by it, right? You have to be able to see it or taste it or smell it. And she says that disgust in many ways um, is associated with, with food, where you wouldn't really call like um, uh, a poor job done to make a car or, or a poor carpentry job done disgusting. Disgusting to call something disgusting is kind of reserved for things that that might produce a, a bad smell or a bad taste. Uh, they aren't really things that, you know, you can see, even though that's part of it. Uh, but there's something specific about food for Ahmed, because with food, it is something that you have to internalize by eating it. You know, it becomes a part of you, ostensibly. It is something you put into your body. And so it demands a kind of vulnerability to eat food. Like if you eat at a restaurant or you eat anything, you're putting a lot of faith not only in the quality of the food you are eating, but in the person that is preparing it for you. Not to say people are like deliberately doing things wrong, uh, but that you do not know if the kitchen from which it comes is nearly as sanitary as it could be, um, or, you know, the person preparing it, to, you know, cooked your chicken right or something or whatever you're eating. And additionally, so another important thing about disgust is that it often elicits a kind of fascination where when we are disgusted by something, we often can't help but take another look 
at it or, or to experience it once more, almost to make sure that we are right, we're justified in our very strong uh, response to it. So it demands a kind of, uh, a, a kind of retreat from the thing and then a return to it. But no object, of course, is inherently disgusting. Ahmed proposes instead that its association with disgust is contingent upon its existence in an entire economy of disgust. So disgust. So like we're, we've already been saying, like it circulates. Um, like the idea of people of color with, with dirtiness, right? And this was a trope that went on for a long time where uh, non-white people were viewed as people that were just dirty and that you could scrub off color, right? As though white people are not, they don't have a color on themselves this you know it's just a way to naturalize whiteness to say that whiteness is the base of every kind of racial identity so disgust then in this in this way maintains certain power relations insofar as it is associated with certain people so interestingly it also signals the vulnerability of the person who experiences disgust by the threatening other and we see this, this, you know, this was echoed previously with the uh, vulnerability of the nation in relation to uh, a possible, you know, invading other in the form of immigrants or asylum seekers or something like that. So what this does, disgust, is it reveals the vulnerability of the person experiencing the disgust as though they are under threat by this thing. So here I want to expand on a pretty key term in this book, and it's one that's kind of come up. A few times but I haven't mentioned it yet because I was waiting for this point in which she really kind of digs into it and this is the idea of stickiness so stickiness is for maybe a non uh, native English speaker stickiness is when two things um, get stuck together or or it is the state of being sticky of having things uh, being stuck to you can be stuck to you. Wow, it's a weirder, harder term to define than I thought. But anyways, so in the economy of effects or of effective signs, stickiness is what holds things together. So, and these threaten to cohere things with subjects. So some objects are considered sticky over others for their relation to other sticky and therefore invasive things. So stickiness for Ahmed implies both a binding and a blockage. It binds things and makes connections, but it also works to concretize relations by sticking some attributes to some people. So like uh, race and the association of race and dirtiness. So in the economy of effective signs, we have these two signs. We have race and we have dirtiness. And Ahmed says that these two things have been stuck together in the kind of cultural, anthropological, um, historical imaginary. But these two things don't naturally stick together. But these terms, through their having circulated in this economy of effects, come to accrue a certain amount of stickiness, which can then attach to each other very easily then where the idea of whiteness as another sign and dirtiness don't stick together in this kind of cultural imaginary. So one way in which this is uh, evoked or repeated is in uh, cleaning commercials. So in cleaning commercials, I'll just bar for a second. I'll just bracket off the fact that they're often very gendered, even though that's there. Instead, I want to focus on how in a cleaning commercial, let's say Mr. Clean, what often happens is that white settings are revealed underneath dirtiness. So it's like a, a bathroom tile. And for some reason, there, there's, you know, a inch layer of thickness of, of dirty dust or something on this white tile. And this Mr. Clean wipe, wipes it away to reveal whiteness underneath. And it's so often about wiping away brownness or dark, some kind of dark tone to reveal whiteness underneath. And I don't know if anyone watches, I'm sure some people here watch RuPaul's Drag Race, but in the, 
One of the most recent seasons, there was a contestant named Brooklyn Heights. And in one of her performances, she came out with a wig. Um, a very, uh, uh, with a, uh, that happened to be a very big afro. You know, a pretty uh, important, iconic uh, look for a lot of black women, especially, you know, a few years ago in like the 70s and 80s and stuff. Uh, and still, obviously, to this day. And right at the beginning, she strips off this wig to reveal this flowing, you know, white hair. Her hair wasn't white, but it was hair that's often associated with white people. As though underneath the black persona is this kind of white, uh, this kind of whiteness that can be unearthed and revealed. So that shows that these two effective signs, whiteness and dirtiness, don't stick together. They don't, there, there isn't a stickiness there. But, uh, you know, a racial marker, like, um, like blackness and dirtiness, do stick together in our kind of cultural imagination. I think I, I think that was explained all right. <laughs> Don't need to try that again. So when you uh, a, a racial slur is spoken against a group of uh, a person or a group of people, often with that slur are a number of other um, signifiers assumed and attached to it that stick to the signifier. And of course, I won't repeat any here, but you can you can in your own minds think about the ways that certain racial slurs imply certain other things with them um, and so disgust because that's what we're working with with this chapter uh, participates in the maintenance of some signs with as sticky it maintains some signs as being sticky and in that way it is performative like it it attains a certain value through repetitive uh, utterances through repetitive iterations that then give it a certain appeal and give it a certain mold that it can through which it can perform to then repeat more and to attain more uh, stickiness and more more kind of um, cultural <laughs> hatred or animosity directed towards it and of course this explains things like collective rage against uh you know brown people in the post 9-11 period associating you know muslim people with uh terrorism you know stickiness terrorist and muslim stick together but when a white kid goes in and to a church of black people and kills 14 people or into a school and kills 20 other kids terrorist is not a sticky term that is that sticks to that that person you know instead the other terms are like, oh, well, psychologically unstable or psychotic or uh, evil, things like that. But that propels us here into chapter five, shame before others. So she returns here in this chapter to consider uh, the bringing them home report that we talked about in the first episode in Australia, uh, to consider the way that shame galvanizes group identity and specifically galvanizes or constructs uh, brings together uh, Australian national identity. So in its kind of bare bones elements, uh, shame involves what she calls a self negation. Shame is when we want to cower away and we almost want to get outside of our own skin. Like we want to just, uh, you know, completely leave ourselves because of the kind of uh, the animosity that we feel for ourselves in the moment of shame. So we want to escape from others and we want to escape from ourselves. But what is, how does shame come about? Like, we must feel shame because of something. And Ahmed uses Freud here. And we'll get into this a little bit as we go on here. But she says that shame is something that is experienced when we fail to live up to the ideal of what she calls an ideal other. So someone that is other than ourselves that we look up to that we don't live up to. We don't live up to the idea, the ideals of the ideal other. And we care about what this ideal thinks because we love this ideal. So the existence of shame reveals a, some kind of social relation, a social relation not only with this ideal other, but in many cases with others around us who are not this ideal other that you know, by virtue of magnitude, by the numbers of these people, give 
more force to this ideal other, where they kind of um, strengthen the idea of this ideal other. So in that way, shame can often come about by straying that is going away from uh, a kind of normative relation uh, or a kind of normative social setting. So like she uses the example of queer people who stray from the ideal of the nuclear family uh, and who then are, you know, if they don't feel shame, are expected to feel shame, to be shameful for breaking from the norm in that way. And so on the national level, people that fail to uh, comply with the norm will feel, might feel shame as well. And the nation itself might feel shame if it fails to live to its own kind of ideals. So national shame might emerge from this, the nation's reflecting upon its past and its treatment of others. So in the case of Australia, the collective feeling of shame does less to atone for past violence or to make up for it. Uh, then, it recon then it works to recon reconcile itself through witnessing the pain of others. So we've already kind of mentioned this, and I will say that the rest of the book is a little bit repetitive with what went on before, but there are subtle differences. Um, so she says that, in fact, by demonstrating shame, the national subject makes of themselves an ideal subject because they they can look upon themselves and say, oh, wow, what a wonderful person I am for feeling shame, for, for having this response to this violence inflicted. And considers what was called the, the sorry, sorry books, uh, that involved individual Australians writing messages of, of condolence and support for the indigenous people. So part of its purpose was to motivate the government to, to formally apologize for harms of the past. And what this amount, essentially amounts to for Ahmed is, uh, if only we can acknowledge our past, we can be a proud nation, right? If only we can get past our past, and come to terms with it, can we be a strong, proud nation? Which, of course, she doesn't like because that just reinscribes the same distinction between, you know, the sovereign national subject and the others that do not abide by that standard. But, of course, at, I think at the time of writing, Australia still hadn't apologized. And it was around this time that Canada had apologized. Although 2004 seems a little early. It might have been a few years after that maybe, when Canada had officially apologized under the Harper government for um, the crimes inflicted upon uh, indigenous communities. But that, you know, is just a band-aid on a much bigger problem, right? Um, so in this, in this case, we have the Bringing Them Home Report and the Sorry Books on one side that advocate for shame. They advocate for the experience of shame on a national and personal level. And the nation, and then we have the nation on the other side denying shame. So Australia hadn't uh, apologized yet. So both of these, however, both the bringing them home report and the nation saying that there's nothing to feel shameful for or apologizing, both of these participate in a solipsistic affirmation. That is this kind of circular affirmation of the nation while refusing to step back and listen to those most effective which is for, it comes down to this, they blocked the hearing of the other's testimony. So it became a matter of speaking for the people that the ones hurt, or it was a matter of just not listening and saying that there's nothing to apologize for, which is obviously neither of which are, are great. Uh, I guess one is a lesser demon than the other, but still. And that puts us here uh, to chapter six, in the name of love. So she considers here again uh, the rhetoric of love appropriated by hate groups, uh, which is just a, essentially a derision for reverse racism. And it's something I'm sure we've all heard that like when white people say that uh, black people are racist because a black person says like, um, you know, all you white people are, are racist, <laughs> like as th that's reverse racism. Uh, that's essentially what she equates that with. So here she begins kind of drawing from Freud that I alluded to. So in Freud, uh, love can be divided into two forms of love. There's narcissistic love, which is the love of the self. And then there's anaclytic love or anaclytic love, which is the love of an other. 
So Ahmed transposes these two forms of love, calling them identification, uh, which is love as being, and idealization, which is love as having, respectful, respectively. So that might be hard to follow, so let me just explain that again. So we have narcissistic, which is love of the self. She says that that is identific identification love, which is love as being. Then on the other side, we have anaclytic love, which is love of the other, which is idealization, which is love of having. So identifying de identification demands an expansion of the subject to be like the other. Identification and idealization participate in the kind of heterosexual matrix uh, of, of identity and, and relationships, where identification is love for father whom we want to become. So we're thinking about ourselves here. We want to be like that father. Idealization is love for mother. So that's a love of the object that we want to possess. So identification, love of the self, in this case, love of father, because I can become father. Uh, and idealization is love of the mother because we love that object that treats us. We don't want to become the mother. We want to love the mother. So this is how we explain the difference in love between love for uh, one parent over the other in, in Freud's work. So she expands on this a little bit more to say that heterosexuality implies difference. That is the difference between man and woman to come together in this bond uh, where there are two halves that make a whole right in the, in the, the, the end of the day and for the psycho uh, analyst this is necessary that is the meeting of uh, two different halves to come together to form a whole as the basis of the family unit for kids to be properly socialized right that you know we need this necessary dynamic for the psychoanalyst so Ahmed troubles this idea suggesting that the hetero couple is not nearly as different from one another as they might suggest and that is because they belong to a kind of normative uh, regime of sameness where they are inscribed within the same kind of normative regime. And therefore, we have to be careful in assuming that they are, in fact, different. And we must interrogate how many of their differences are really kind of superficial ones. And this is because idealization, and remember, idealization is anaclytic, anaclytic which is uh, the love of the other, love of an object. Uh, and this is because idealization, the turning into women through love, an ideal object, is simply a way to affirm sameness of man. So that's, you know, it's a way to affirm the position, the relative powerful position of men in relation to women. So it doesn't do so much as to, it's not so much the meeting of differences, then it is the rendering of an object for a subject to affirm the position they already assumed of themselves, which is, you know, in my mind, uh, any kind of a meaningful relationship demands that you are with someone that is you see as being an autonomous being, one that is separate from you, one that you do not hinge your um, your your needs upon, but that you can uh, lean upon for help. For they understand you as being an autonomous being that might at times need help. And I don't know why. This is my little therapy thing that I'm not at all qualified for. So obviously take what I say with a serious grain of salt. So why are we talking about this? Well, she uses this to then think about the way that group identity, which is the formation of a kind of uh, love of self, is used to attack an other, to attack the other. So now she jumps into Freud's seminal text, Group, group Psychology, uh, which I've actually done on here. So if you want more on that, you can go check it out. And also Adorno writes about it in The Culture Industry, which I've also done on here that you can go and check out. Uh, so she considers groups, group psychology and the analysis of the psychology of the ego or something to highlight the role of love in galvanizing group identity. So in this text, Freud wants to dissuade us from thinking that groups are just like irrational formations of people guided purely by, um, you know, uh, emotion, like just violent, hostile emotion. Freud thinks that people are actually bound together by love, by a kind of libidinal energy. And this comes about when they love a leader that binds them in a kind of mutual love for them. 
So each of these people have love for a leader that then come to see, recognize that sameness in themselves, that kind of common trait in their love for the leader, which is very, very relevant when it comes to like uh, Donald Trump and for his rallies, where these people, even though Donald Trump is completely indifferent to all of these people, and in fact, laments having to, <laughs> having to be near any of these people, uh, these people still feel that they love Donald Trump and they, they experience this love together and that brings them together as a group. So interestingly though, though, when love isn't reciprocated, like when the nation doesn't deliver the goods or when Donald Trump doesn't actually love his followers, we associate then with uh, an even more intense form of love. We then form a more intense form of love to kind of compensate for that lack of love. And this might explain for Ahmed why poor people uh, kind of defend an evil nation or a nation that, you know, strips them of their uh, autonomy, takes away, um, you know, their jobs, their job security, their benefits. The people might still love that nation if it does that because of this explanation by Freud. So it might seem to be then uh, that people especially like this kind of love because of its intensity and are therefore that much more predisposed to uh, hating innocent others to maintain their unhappiness because it is in that unhappiness that they strive for more and it, it strengthens the group even though it makes people less happy. And so we are repeatedly, we, we repeatedly kind of construct enemies to defer the realization of love and the ideal. So we say, you know, if we can... Uh, fix this immigrant problem, then we will be, the nation will love us again, or we, we will, we will live happily after that. But of course, that doesn't, doesn't actually uh, do anything. It doesn't fix the problem that is often rooted in larger systemic issues. But we see this come out not only in these kind of overt forms of hate, where you have like racist masses hating immigrants. We also see this in the politics of hospitality, where you have countries like Canada that tout ideas about multiculturalism and claim to be multicultural. Uh, and we see then the kind of correlative in these, these multicultural settings where those that fail to comply are seen as enemies to the nation's cosmopolitan ethos. Where multiculturalism, despite its claim, and, and in Canada we have this idea of this mosaic, right? Instead of the melting pot, pot we have a mosaic, which is like... Uh, you know, a big blanket, I guess, a work of art or whatever, in which different uh, cultures are inscribed upon this blanket. So we welcome difference. And we don't say that you have to assimilate, but we kind of do. And Ahmed sees right through that, where she says that new immigrants are essentially expected to adapt to the national values of multiculturalism, lest they are, you know, shunned almost completely. So in her words, this ideal image can be described as a hybrid whiteness. The nation's whiteness is confirmed through how it incorporates and is colored or bronzed by others. So the nation doesn't allow people to come in because it actually cares about these people. It does it so that it looks good, so that the nation looks good as a cosmopolitan uh, and multicultural nation. So we must be very suspicious of that. And that here propels us into chapter 7, Queer Feelings. Now, this is what she would eventually turn into the book Queer Phenomenology, which I've done on here. So if you want a longer explanation of this, go buy the book and read it. But if you don't have time to do that, um, or, you know, you, you're scared because it might be too difficult or anything, like, I, I present it on here and it might make it more accessible. So she starts at this chapter by considering the way that heterocoupling, that's a coupling between a man and a woman, is the archetypal base for national reproduction. And others, that is uh, gay people, for example, are shunned. And this is what she calls, and Judith Butler calls, uh, compulsory heterosexuality. So failure to orient yourself properly uh, will affect how you are perceived and how you navigate the world. Where if... Um, let's say a lesbian couple is holding hands, walking through the street, they can certainly expect to have comments hurled at them uh, or in many different forms, whereas um, a hetero couple walking down the street doesn't have to worry about be, you know, being yelled at for not 
abiding by the norm because they are the norm. So she uses the example of a chair and how chair, if you fit comfortably in a chair, you almost stop feeling the chair. You, you, the distance or the difference between yourself and the chair kind of goes away where you don't know where you end and the chair begins. And that only happens with certain bodies where a larger body in that chair, a fat body, won't have that same effect. And how privilege allows people to kind of disappear into the folds of the social uh, paradigm. So heteronormativity then is sustained through repetition. And we get this a lot more profoundly, I think, in the work of Judith Butler, whose work I've done on here. And this is most, uh, this is coming primarily from her first book, Gender Trouble, which I've done on here as well, if you want to know what's going on there, at least through my eyes. And I'm not, I don't know the most about this, but um, yeah. So she says that heteronormativity is a thing. But she also says that there's the possibility of homonormativity, where if you have uh, a homosexual couple that are like, let's say, for the war effort, for lowering taxes, for, um, you know, mass incarceration, that are against protests, that are interested only in getting a house and having like the 2.3 kids and the white picket fence, then there is the entrance of certain non-normative bodies into a normative landscape. So in response to that, we have what's called queer theory, hence the title of the chapter, uh, queer, queer Feelings. And queer theory, oh, I will just say, I think we, it kind of comes out of the work of Eve Sedgwick. Um, but in any case, uh, queer theory opposes not only heteronormativity, it opposes normativity altogether. So even homonormativity, because homonormativity still follows the script that queer theory challenges. Now, because we characterize queer theory as being uh, opposed to kind of rigidities and opposed to scripts does not mean that it is like hypermobile. In fact, there are a lot of queer folk that aren't mobile, right? Who, by virtue of their uh, queer identity, are actually denied being allowed to move freely through space. So queerness is not like an opening up, right, of possibility. In many ways, it can be, it can close possibilities because of the various disciplinary forces that that govern bodies, govern what bodies can do, and which bodies can go where. So rather than attributing value to queerness by its non-normativity alone, Ahmed draws uh, attention to how it disrupts normativity. It is in not fitting, she says, uh, the model of the nuclear family that queer families can work to transform what it is families can do. So, uh, in, she continues here in her words, discomfort is hence not about assimilation or resistance, but about inhabiting norms differently. And this is also coming out of Judith Butler, where at the end of Gender Trouble, Judith Butler warns against applauding difference for the sake of difference. And instead, and she uses drag to kind of think about this, even though uh, c certainly uh, m many trans thinkers have, have troubled this, this idea, but I'm going to mention it um, just because it's an important part of this history. Uh, Judith Butler attributes a certain transgressive potential to drag, because in drag, we see the reversal of certain identity markers. And these aren't like broad, uh, you know, spectacular forms of resistance or transgression. They exist within the confines of the gender binary in many cases. But it is by working within these very, um, you know, these very structured forms that we see their undoing from the inside. So, you know, the Marxists out there might say, oh, well, then Butler and Ahmed are just, you know, reformists. You know, they aren't going after the system totally. They're just trying to tweak it from the inside. To which I think, I think Ahmed would say, well, yeah, of course, because this is how uh, any kind of resistance begins. It is by troubling or at least showing the limits of any assumed to be uh, complete and total uh, impenetrable system. So from here, Ahmed then draws her attention to grief, uh, specifically grief of the AIDS crisis, uh, where queer bodies were not grieved like normative bodies. 
and this is evident in the way that the United States did almost nothing for uh, the AIDS crisis, the AIDS epidemic. So Ahmed suggests that because being queer demands breaking from the category of life, as we know it, normative bodies, normative life, they become less than human in many cases and are therefore not grievable or they are they are already dead in life because they have broken away from what everything that we know about life. And then we jump ahead to the post 9-11 period in which queer lives that were lost were essentially uh, heightened or were uh, highlighted in order to demonstrate, you know, the nation's uh, tolerance of others or those that non-normative people. So Ahmed is suspicious of both renouncing queer recognition and uh, completely advocating for it because, you know, if it's just being advocated to elevate the status of the nation, then that's bad. Uh, She wants to instead find a different way of grieving, one that is queer, more or less. So considers first Freud's idea of mourning. Mourning is in, like, to grieve, uh, which is letting go of lost object versus melancholia, which is the internalization of a lost object. So when you mourn something, you, you recognize it being gone forever. Whereas with melancholia, you hold the thing within you. So Freud seeks to cure melancholia because it, uh, it arrests, it freezes the possibility of healing. Because when you hold the thing with you, you, you can't move past it. So in contrast to Freud, Ahmed believes that melancholia is less an internalization of what was external then it is the maintenance of the impressions that the other imprinted upon us. So it's not as though in the act of dying, we then suddenly, in the last moments, internalize a person. The melancholia that Freud is describing is an extension. It's an extension of the impression, them having already existed within you during their life because they had effects on you. They, they mark themselves upon you, not deliberately, but just by their being there by being your friend or you know someone that you cared for um so in that way uh the only way we feel grief is by losing someone that was part of us and maybe then ahmed says that the kind of potency the potential behind queer grief is in the acknowledgement of these impressions that people leave on us during life um, and the efforts to keep them alive through sharing right by talking about the people after they die, keeping their their memories alive, you know, so that they, in the act of death, don't really fall out of circulation in this, what we recognize now to be an economy of effects, but still exist within that and still hold some kind of currency. I'm just using the word currency because we're talking about economy. Um, I'm just keeping up with the metaphor, which it does open up an individual dimension to grief. Uh, where each individual person has a different experience of the person lost and so can therefore bring, you know, their own history along with the impression the person had on them to the table that can then circulate in this general economy. So to finish this chapter, she moves from grief to pleasure to consider how queer pleasure is commodified by global capitalism, right, to be evacuated of any potential. So there is a potential in queer pleasure. However, this pleasure, uh, this potential is realized when queer pleasure is, is uh, tied to the to to the histories of those involved. And as such, uh, is somewhat grounded. That is, it isn't just a free floating enterprise that can be appropriated by anyone. When is when it is conducted in this way, it upsets normativity. So in her words, she says, it is the non transcendence of queer that allows queer to do its work. And I really, really like that. Um, Because queerness is not, at least the potential behind it, is not in its totally uh, leaving or being separate from the normative paradigm. It exists in proximity to it and is in many ways articulated, you know, when it is appropriated by the normative framework, it is articulated in order to justify and to strengthen the existence of the normative framework. But on its own, uh, queerness is is defined by its proximity to, to what is normative. So we can't lose sight of that. And then I just really like that quote. And that puts us here into chapter eight, feminist attachments. 
So she starts this with a quote from Sunera Tobani calling for decreased Canadian military action alongside the United States in the post 9-11 period. And Tobani was accused of hate crimes, essentially, uh, against Americans for calling for this reduced military action. So for questioning American foreign policy, Tobani was uh, aligned with terrorism and was therefore an enemy to freedom, democracy, and truth. She, there were a lot of other negative consequences. I, you know, I think that she lost her job um, you know, by calling attention to the war effort in, in the United States and Canada's complicity and participation alongside of it. So in Ahmed's words, such attacks uh, on Tobani's speech work to exclude it from the register of legitimate speech by constructing her as motivated by a purely negative passion, like she was just being too emotional, essentially. Of course, she was told to go back to where she came from because she's, she's a woman of color uh, and was told, like, well, if you don't like it here, go back to wherever you, you come from. So her challenge, that is Tobani's challenge, was viewed as an emotional response to Western and masculinist irrationality. That is because, you know, she was probably crying at the time because I don't see how you could talk about that uh, at that time in our lives without uh, being saddened, you know, knowing about all the dead Iraqi children. Um, And her challenge was viewed as an emotional response then to Western and masculinist rationality. So Ahmed doesn't want to argue here uh, that Tobani was rational and to say that, no, she wasn't a, she wasn't being emotional uh, and she was actually being rational because for Ahmed, that would simply reinscribe the split between rationality and emotionality. Uh, instead, she attributes value to the emotional. She wants to say that the emotional is valuable. And, you know, just looking back at how we started this, uh, thinking about the ways in which, like, Alex Jones is not considered emotional or how screaming uh, angry football fans are not considered emotional, right? They're considered passionate. When people are fighting for, when militia groups are forming up and killing um, immigrants, they aren't seen as being emotional, but it seems to be only women, right? That show sadness or anger. And What it comes down to is that our very capacity to be political depends upon our caring about something. Like we care enough about something to be political about it, to have a political opinion. So at its core, to be political means to be, in some respect, emotional. So keeping up with what Ahmed's been saying throughout this whole book, this shows how politics is tied to the world and how it is impossible to simply transcend it, right? To simply get out of Uh, concrete experience, emotions, affect. So something like feminism as a political project doesn't emerge through like a rational a priori, just through thinking alone. It comes about through experience. And it is by virtue of that, that it is tied up with the very histories of violence that are inflicted upon bodies that in many ways necessitate feminism, which can then give in some respects a kind of... um, a a cognitive or an intellectual account of those systemic forms of violence, of those violences inflicted upon people. So it works in a kind of holistic way here where emotion and rationality, and I don't want to think that these two things are separate, but I'm just trying to say that they work together and are very much entwined with one another and motivate and influence one another. And one of the most radical things about feminism, and this kind of sets the tone for feminism's opening up to possibility, is not by its um, disavowing history, disavowing affect, disavowing uh, violence. It is by coming to terms with them, by living with them, by experiencing them, that it can open itself up to something new. So anger uh, in feminism is not then a detached individual event. It is bound to history and the systemic conditions that elicit that very anger. And to hope then is to, in her, is to kind of in, act in and upon the present world. And so the, I guess the task of feminism is to, for her, in her words here, it is to hold those objects of feminism, that is gender, oppression, as close as possible to allow for their transformation and not to bracket them off. Right. And not to experience them and not to uh, 
um, acknowledge them within a certain economy of effects. And this happens through work, right? It can't just happen uh, by thinking things and then arm, by armchair philosophers. And that puts us here into the final chapter, the conclusion, titled Just Emotions. So she starts with a quote in which an Iraqi boy named Ali uh, lost his arms. Um, and this, this quote, it was kind of a poster, a plea to um, the public, uh, kind of pleading for the sympathy of the casual, for casualties of war. So Ahmed is suspicious, pointing to the ways that this reinforces the West's belief in their superiority, right, as caregivers, as we've already said. So what is more, this quote locates injustice with the infliction of physical harm. So we often forget about emotional harm and the other kinds of trauma that come with, uh, with war and colonization, uh, which is a deeply problematic thing to say, uh, to associate physical harm and, and worthiness of, uh, of sympathy. Because not all oppressed people would agree that they are they have been harmed, right? Um, because if we set set that out as the condition, then not all colonized people experience physical harm. So therefore, we don't recognize their harm. And also, people might be said to have uh, healed from historical harm, um, which might be the case and it might not. But it's also it's difficult to assess. Uh, and we shouldn't try to conceal, essentially, this is how she concludes the book, we shouldn't try to conceal the scars inflicted upon people through our kind of like humanitarian efforts. Like if we just throw money at the Red Cross or any kind of uh, charitable organization, then therefore we can absolve ourselves of guilt or to use a fancy word, we can kind of propitiate to, to make amends through an offering. But yeah, that's, that's about it. Um, if... I mischaracterized Ahmed. If anyone wants more clarification, you know how to leave a comment to ask or tell me off. Uh, and if you want to help me out without, you know, giving money, uh, you can always like and share and subscribe. It, it means a lot. Um, and yeah, on that note, see you next time.